Hey everybody, I am back with a little bit more from the South by Southwest 2020 collection, which is available free on Amazon Prime until May 6th. Of course, after that, uh, a lot of these will start appearing on different streaming platforms, but uh, this will kind of give you a head start if you have time or if you want to know what's out there. I have a couple of features from that, and I also have one more short. I may have a few more before it's over, but this at least gets you started. Um, before I get going, we go a couple quick plugs. Uh, obviously, I have my YouTube channel, but uh, some of my uh, some of my reviews are going to be featured on deepestdream.com. Uh, that is a great site for all things entertainment. They have lots and lots of movie reviews, not all by me. It's run by Greg, who also does cinematics. Uh, so if you know the Cinematics Podcast, that's a great place. I'll link a bunch of the stuff down below. Uh, and also, I am just starting um, a group podcast called Movie Mainline. And that is myself and uh, three other people. And we all bring you three, two to three streaming mostly uh, movie options for that week. So by the time you leave that, you should have somewhere around 12 different things to choose from for that week. Uh, it should give you a lot of options and a lot of things to check out. All right, that being said, we're going to discuss a couple things here. Uh, the first one we've got is Le Choc de Futur. <laughs> That's my French. Thank you very much. Uh, the Shock of the Future. Um, these are all 2019, although I assume that in reality, they're really dropping in 2020 for most people. Uh, Le Choc de Futur is French. It is directed by Marc Cullen, uh, and it stars Alma Yodorowsky. Yodorowsky. It's spelled just the same as the director of Holy Mountain and all that stuff. I didn't go to do the research to see if she might be his daughter or granddaughter. Um, but that being said, whether she is or isn't, uh, you might know her from Blue is the Warmest Color. That's where she first got notoriety. Uh, and she is the main star of this feature. Uh, it's a period piece, 1978. Um, and I'll kind of go in warning you, it's kind of a day in the life and it's mostly in her apartment. So. A lot of people are going to find this to be a pretty dull movie because not a lot happens, you know. Um, so it's much more of a character piece. And if you're kind of into that sort of thing, then this might be up your alley. So the basic concept is this. Uh, she plays Anna and she is staying in uh, another person's apartment. She's allowed to stay in there while he's away doing business. So. The reason that comes into play is what you see early on is she gets up and there's all this kind of electronic music. It's 1978. Uh, it's kind of the beginning. Uh, it's the end of the first wave of punk. Um, and it's just leading into, you know, kind of the new wave uh, explosion. But you haven't got really quite into the full blow up of the early 80s. So it's kind of post-punk pre-new wave. So you've got bands like craft work and stuff like that are out you know Gary Newman's just getting started some of that kind of stuff's just getting going but it's not hasn't blown up into mainstream society yet the reason that's important is that she is into electronic music so early on she gets up she you know, does her stretches in the morning you're hearing music she goes over she starts playing on a synthesizer it's a pretty big nice synthesizer but then she turns around and it pans around to the other side of the apartment and the whole other wall is just full of electronic equipment. Um, and if you're into especially 70s, 80s electronic gear, I'm sure this is just like, like a, you know, a God moment here when you see this wall of electronic equipment. And the reason that I mentioned she was staying in someone else's apartment, it's not her equipment. So that make because the first thing you ask to yourself is like, how did this, you know, single young, not looking to be a very employed person get all this equipment. Well, that's how she got it. It's, she's getting to use this person's equipment while he's away doing his other work. So anyway, it's got sequencers and patches and other keyboards attached to it. It's other kinds of weird synthesizers. On the, off to the side, you see a theremin, if you know what a theremin is. Um, so it's pretty cool. And she starts messing around with it. So basically the whole movie is her getting kind of visited throughout the day by different people. She gets visited by a guy who's trying to get her to finish an advertisement soundtrack and she's not doing it. She wants to do her own art, but she's trying to make money, you know, kind of the artist journey that you hear a lot. Uh, the next guy comes in is kind of the older dude who's like 
all into cool new music and he always is trying to introduce people. I would say he's kind of the equivalent of the uh, record store owner guy, right? Or, I mean, I would be like this too to a lot of people like, hey, have you ever heard this? Have you ever heard that? You ever heard this? So he brings her like seven records and they're all real records and he's putting them down. He's playing her a demo of Human League when they just got started and he's playing a Suicide, which she doesn't like because it's too rock and roll. So for my own context, what I th thought was interesting about this was, you know, in this age, in this era, I'm really into rock. I'm really into punk rock. I do not like New Wave. So it's kind of fun to see the other side of things and to see the level of experimentation and the level of newness that people who were really on the forefront of electronic music were also in their own way really blazing a trail and doing something really odd and interesting. And that aspect I really appreciated. So anyway, she get, keeps getting visited. Uh, and then at one point she gets visited by a woman who is supposed to be in the ad that she was supposed to make, which she's basically given up on. Um, and that woman helps her and they kind of, they kind of collaborate to make one of her songs, Anna's songs, um, come to life. And uh, the biggest thing that happens to her is this other guy comes in and he's kind of obviously kind of on her wavelength. You know, he's kind of the weirdo dude into music electronics and he's running around doing stuff and he comes to her apartment and he brings her a, 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 drum, um, a beatbox. And people have probably heard the term beatbox, but you may have never seen a beatbox. And a beatbox was like a big console, like you see those big stereo consoles, like um, like receivers and all these kind of tape decks and all those things that people that aren't as you know old and don't see them as much. But you've seen stereo components, and it's like that, a big box, but it would make all the drum beats and all the you know, the different uh, tones and all the different, uh, and what it did is it would it would key into the sequencer and then it would actually sync up to that and you'd get all these crazy electronic beats and you could change them on the fly. And she's amazed by this technology. So basically the whole, the whole movie is her day and by the time she gets to the end of the day, she's gonna try to, you know, show her song to some big record mucky mucks. So I quite like this movie. But I can imagine this is not for everybody. I mean, for me, this is right on the edge of four stars. Um, because I liked her and I liked the journey she was on. And I love music and the creative process. So for me, that was a lot of fun to watch. But for a lot of people, I could imagine this being like going to your friend's house and having him just show you, play you records. And that could be uh, the most boring thing in the world for you. So hopefully I've given you enough information to know whether this is your cup of tea or not. All right. The next feature uh, from that festival that I watched is called Cat in the Wall. Now, Cat in the Wall is made by uh, a Bulgarian duo. Um, the directors are Vasela Kasakova and Mina Maleva. Hopefully I said those relatively correctly. Um, and it is supposed to be semi-autobiographical of one of the directors. Uh, it's funny because they do the little introduction, introduction at the beginning. They say something about... Um, I wish I would have remembered it and written it down. They say something like they're known in their country as like the, the devil twins or something weird like that. Because obviously they make highly political movies or they did back home. This is taking place in London and it's a little lighter, but it, it still has its dark moments. So you've got a, a woman and her son, that's Irina and Jojo, Jojo's a son, and then her brother, um, which is Vladimir. Uh, the woman's played by Irina Atanasova. And Jojo the Sun is played by uh, Orlan Osinov. Uh, and I, I feature them because I think they're the strongest in this uh, movie. Basic concept is they live in this kind of, um, I wouldn't say it's run down, but it's an older apartment slash condo building. And it's definitely not in the better area of London because you're always hearing sirens and stuff. So you know it's not the best area. Um, but, and she is not like an illegal... Uh, immigrant there or anything. She's just working her way through her life. So she's she is trained as an architect. She's trying to get some architect jobs, but in the meantime, she's working at restaurants and bars. Uh, her brother, though, is there illegally, from what you understand. He's getting side jobs, and then of course her son is 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 very young. He's only about you know seven or eight, it looks like. Uh, and it's it's a lot of a day in the life. So. Cat in the Wall almost sounds like a horror movie. It's not. The whole reason that Cat in the Wall comes in is that early on within the day-to-day -day life that you're watching, they see this kind of stray cat that's kind of 
you know, crawling around on the railing on the railings and stuff of the apartment complex. And at some point, it ends up they end up taking it in. And there's a whole level of conflict that occurs because uh, another member of the apartment complex says they own that cat, and that creates some conflict. Uh, the interesting, the most interesting and positive aspects of this movie are a couple things. One is it really gets into the whole idea of gentrification and immigration, and obviously with Brexit and all that, that's important stuff. Um, but the way it presents it is really interesting. It's very much more down to earth. You know, she has bought this condo. So the idea is that this big building has a bunch of people who have bought the units, and some people have not bought the units, and they're essentially on what's the equivalent of um, English welfare. When this the building decides they're going to upgrade everything in the apartment complex, they've got these giant scaffoldings up, they're going to rebuild and, and improve everything, all the people who own the apartments have to pay for all that above what they were already paying, and all the people who are on, you know, on assistance don't. So that's so. As far as Arena is concerned, she's a hard worker, and she's getting stuck with everyone else's bill. On the other side of that, the people who are on the assistance, who end up having the conflict with her over the cat, they are from the attitude of like, "You're not from our country. Why are you here? You're taking our jobs." Blah blah blah. So. It's looking at some of those basic conflicts that you see, you know, here and abroad and really personalizing them. And I think that is the big strength of this movie, along with the fact that the way this is presented is very, it seems very almost documentary-like. And I know they're actors and I know they're acting in situations, but they really capture a very real-life feel to these characters and where they live, almost like it's not acted, almost like it's improvised. I especially bring up the kid. He's amazing in this. He doesn't seem like he's acting. Um, and I don't know how much they just let him run and do things and how much direction they gave him, but it's uh, very naturalistic, the way it's done. Now on the downside of this, um, it's not it's not dramatic enough. There's not enough of an arc for me. So I know it's kind of weird because the one I just presented was a day in the life of a woman making music, you know. But I like that better because I kind of fell into that vibe, whereas this one seems like it should have more of a dramatic arc. And I feel like there were some events that happened halfway through with the conflict of the neighbors, and then almost at the end there's another um, uh, moment of conflict. And I feel like if we would have started a little later in the story or got to that area quicker and allowed it to go a little beyond where the movie ends, um, dramatically it would have been more compelling to me. Uh, so what I would say is, I would say, for me Cat in the Wall is about a three star because of all the good things that I mentioned, whereas Le Choc de Future is almost a four star because I was just more interested and invested and it hit me more. Pop. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention this in Le Choc de Future. A big key to those kind of movies is you have someone created songs and creating music, the music needs to be good because they're creating music that's supposed to be good. And it is, it's, it's good music, I really liked it. Um, last thing is a short, very short, it's only like eight or nine minutes, so you can watch this one really quickly. And it's called Affirmative Action, but the fur is F-U-R. This is directed by Travis Wood. Uh, he introduces it, and uh, <laughs> this is a very humorous little piece, but it's also, it has a little political you know twist to it, and that is, uh, while uh, Travis was looking for jobs in real life, and it sounds like he's a graphic artist or design person because that's all the kind of firms he was looking at, and he started noticing that on the um, the pages where they show all the uh, you know all the leadership of these various groups, it'll say like "Meet our team," you know, something like that. If you go to their website, and it'll have pictures of all the people that are on their management team, you know, other CEOs, and CFOs, and blah 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 blah. And he started noticing on a lot of these sites, they would all have this, and then there'd be a cutesy picture of one of their dogs. And the dog would say, you know, chief furry officer, or, you know, <laughs> you know, petting executive, or whatever, you know. And uh, he just goes through tons of these, uh, very humorously, edited really well, and starts showing that, like, there, there's a ton of white people and dogs, but no black people in any of these firms. And it's like the dogs get hired before the black people get hired. And um, there's some really humorous uh, twists he takes on that because the firms have, some of them have multiple animals. 
Uh, and it's once again, it's very light, very quick, uh, but also there's a little uh, obvious uh, political twist there, which is well, well uh, taken, I would say. Anyway, hope you enjoyed that. I'll have some different types of movies coming up to you soon, and I will talk to you then. Bye.